the Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, fireworks in Dayton, Ohio, bring down a UFO that it turns out to be a British spaceship of the line from an alternate dimension where England didn't piss off its offspring with idiotic taxation demands. Hey, it turns out that sooner or later your kids are all that stand between you and a plate full of dog food. King Georgie Porgy Pudding and Pie. Maybe in a happier world, Britain would be celebrating Independence Day too. Well, as we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Well, the interns have been shooed out the door for the week to go and do independence things, and I'm back behind the mic for the intros and bumpers this time. And just in time to say that we have part one of a two-part fun interview with John Ringo. John discusses his new collaboration with Larry Correa, Monster Hunter Memoir Saints, which is book three and the finale of his subseries within Larry Correa's Monster Hunter universe. John talks about working with Larry, about the character plot and setting of the memoirs books, and about his own interesting writing habits and proclivities. So that's coming up. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Leaden Universe novel, Alliance of Equals, getting toward the end there. Now here's the news. July mass markets are raining down like the magnificent paper remains of the greatest fireworks show in the galaxy, which they are. Out now is The Day After Gettysburg by Robert Conroy and J.R. Dunn. Hey, this is the completion of the late Robert Conroy's final alternate history novel, written with great SF writer and political essayist J.R. Dunn. Lee strikes back. After a terrible setback at Gettysburg, Robert E. Lee does not retreat across the Potomac and his ultimate surrender at Appomattox. Instead, he turns the table on Union General George Meade with a vicious counterattack that sets the Union Army on its heels. While Lee sets out across Pennsylvania in a dazzling war of maneuver, a crazed actor closes in on President Abraham Lincoln. Standing in his way is Major Steve Thorne, a thoughtful lawyer turned soldier fighting for the Union and his own self-respect, and Cassandra Baird, a young woman whose courage is only surpassed by her determination to teach emancipated slaves to read and write, and so ensure their freedom. Opposing them is Colonel Corey Wade, a brave Confederate officer who is just as determined to fight to the death for his honor and that of his state. And in the end, the fate of a nation may come down to a freed slave named Hadrian, a man with an iron resolve never to return to bondage. The time has come to strike a blow for liberty or go down swinging. Also out in mass market in July is The Gods of Sagittarius by Eric Flint and Mike Resnick. Russ Tabor is one of the top security specialists in the galaxy. Much against his will, he finds himself assigned to provide protection for Rupert and Medawar, Narayan Shanoi, Lord Shanoi, as he likes to style himself, who is probably the human race's most brilliant savant. Shanoi has become convinced that the race of ancient aliens, known as the Old Ones, possessed powers unknown to any modern intelligent species. He believes they have harnessed forces which may have been actual magic, giving the Old Ones the stature of gods. Yet the Old Ones, those ancient and inimical gods of the galaxy, were thought to have perished eons before. Now human adventurers and an alien shaman are on a collision course with the truth. Despite their many differences, only if they unite their forces do they stand any chance of surviving the coming encounter with the gods of Sagittarius. The Gods of Sagittarius by Eric Flint and Mike Resnick and The Day After Gettysburg by Robert Conroy and J.R. Dunn are both available in mass market format at booksellers everywhere. This is part one of a two-part interview with John Ringo discussing Monster Hunter Memoirs Saints. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. I want to welcome John Ringo to the podcast. Hey, John, it's so great to have you on. Hi. 
John Ringo is the New York Times best-selling creator of the Pauline War series, including one of my personal favorites, uh, first novel in the series, A Hymn Before Battle. Really like that book. He's the creator of the Council War series, the Troy Rising novels, the Empire Man series, co-authored with David Weber, um, all those Kildare uh, military adventure series. On the fantasy side, he's the author of the Queen of Wands series. Uh, I don't know if that's what it's called. Is it? It's the one with uh, it, the it, a contemporary uh, killing of monsters. Special Circumstances is the series name. Um, ah. And it's uh, Princess of Wands, Queen of Wands, and Queen of Swords is the next book. And uh, with zombies, uh, but back to science fiction, lately it's been the Black Tide Rising books. And um, with the, he's the author of many other short stories and uh, series, standalone books, including uh, writing, in addition to David Weber, with Michael Z. Williamson, Tom Crapman, Travis Taylor, Ryan Sear, Julie Cochran, and, and now Larry Correa. Uh, John was in the U.S. Army, a specialist in the 82nd Airborne Division. He served in the Florida National Guard along the way, picked up the Combat Infantryman Badge, Parachutist Badge, Army Commendation Medal, Good Conduct Medal, Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal in Granada, and the National Defense Service Medal. Um, by the way, John, I just went through um, just about every book he ever wrote at Con Carolinas during the Bain Road Show. We did a special Ringo edition that... Uh, a very special John Ringo edition for that. I helped gather the posters. Also, this is Jonathan Graubert, the summer intern, saying hello. Hi, John. So, yeah, we had a uh, we had a really nice crowd there. I, I felt I was perhaps preaching to the choir about how great uh, your work is. <laughs> no protesters? Uh, you know, I hope that there would be, but no. But I did um, at... All of my panels, I was the moderator of several panels, and uh, I, as part of saying who I was, you know, I, I put up a copy of one of my books, and then I said, I'm also a senior editor at Bain Books, and I published such great authors as, and I'd pop up a Ringo. I had several Ringo titles with me. So, you were there, John. <laughs> uh, enough of that. Yes, let's, let's not, <laughs> but just to let you know. And everyone out there. Um, so uh, now at Booksellers, it's Monster Hunter Memoir Saint. Real quick on the theory, uh, sure. on what we were just talking about obliquely. Some people will get it, some people won't. I used to go out to the West Coast do signings a lot. And I would do signings at Other Change of Hobbit in Berkeley. And I don't even know if Other Change of Hobbit is still open or not. But I'd love to do a signing in Berkeley at this point. That'd be freaking awesome. <laughs> you would have crowds inside and out, perhaps. <laughs> I was sitting outside because you can't smoke within 20 feet of a doorway or something. I was yeah. sitting outside at a desk signing all their stock and smoking a cigar, and I had a, a 7.62 design shirt on that had a Barrett team on the back. And the cop like walked to one end of the block and then walked back and then walked back again. And I couldn't figure out if they were guarding me or trying to figure out if they could arrest me. <laughs> they were probably uh, observing uh, a very strange species. <laughs> the, the, or, <laughs> the heart, American from the heartland approaches. Well, uh, God knows what's going to, what all this is going to lead to. I sure as hell hope it, it's a passing story. Because uh, what does it have to do with art, really? Anyway, uh, now out from booksellers is Monster Hunter Memoir Saints by Larry Cree and John Ringo. This is book three and a big entertaining and harrowing finale and coda to the Monster Hunter Memoir series. I know you've told it before, but could you give us sort of a, the origin tale of how you, you came to write this, John? I guess we should start by saying the Monster Hunter series is um, a series created by Larry Correa which is really cool, and you thought it was pretty damn cool, right? <laughs> well, let me let me back up a little bit. Sure. I'm at a convention, and this big kind of balding guy comes up to me, and he goes, Mr. Ringo, I'm a huge fan. I'm writing with Bane now, and I just wanted you to have one of my books. And I'm like, oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Now, here's a funny thing. I found out after he died that Jerry Pornell thought that I was a pretty good author and liked me. And I didn't even know that Jerry Pornell knew my name. I mean, I'd run into him a few times, and it was like, 
hey, Mr. Cornell, and he's like, hey, I don't think he ever actually said, like, John or actually ever used my name directly. So I didn't think he even knew it. And that didn't bother me because I run into a lot of new authors, you know, people who are coming on the scene. And a lot of them say, Mr. Ringo, you're a big inspiration. I really love your books. And I think that's great. I, you know, it's, it's creating the next generation, if you will. Um, just as Jerry Pornell and Robert Heinlein and Larry Niven and a lot of other authors created me, I'm helping to create the next generation of authors. I think that's awesome. Um, but this the guy kind of gives me his book. And I'm like, thank you, you know. And I tossed it in my bag along with a bunch of other books people have given me and just kind of forgot about it. So at some point, somebody is pitching me on, you know, ah, you got to read these books, you got to read these books, you got to read these books. And I just didn't have anything that I felt like reading right now, so I decided to try them out. And uh, I read the first book, Monster Hunter International, and I was like, I, I, I should not use foul language on this podcast, right? That's, that's not something I should, I should do. Uh, I don't – yes. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. We've done it before. I wish I could freaking come up with this idea because this is an awesome freaking idea, okay? And I freaking love these books. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just basically ripped through all of them that were out at that point. The last one was Legion. And uh, Legion, by the way, is one of my favorites because it involves Franks. And I like Franks more than any of his secondary any of, any of the secondary characters. I mean, Franks is the guy that I really identify with, which is weird because he's a total sociopath. But... Um, <laughs> but he's so interesting. Um, but the guy that I really like. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, Earl Harbinger, he's so cool. And I'm like, I got nothing for Earl Harbinger. Um, so that kind of came through a lot with character in these books. In the main book, the main character, Owen Pitt, is a really, you know, Earl Harbinger is this guy that he really looks up to. And these books, the main character, Oliver Chadwick Gardinier, call me Chad. Um, he, he respects Earl. Earl is, you know, he's one of the bosses, and he respects him in that way. Um, but he respects his rank. He doesn't necessarily respect the person, and he, there's no hero worship to it. Um, he actually, in Saints, I think, is where he actually kind of goes off on the subject that he doesn't really like Earl very much. And uh, I cut a lot of I, I cut a large section of him just basically as a paragraph of him going off on how much he disliked Earl. Um, but uh, Chad really, you know, there's no hero worship to him about Earl. Yeah, there's a, and that may be the section where he's sort of explaining to Milo his idea of loyalty, which is, um, which is in, a really interesting uh, statement of, uh, of, of rational philosophy in that regard. I would, I would like to get to that, um, actually later. Um, if you, uh, tell us a little bit about Chad, um, this, this guy that you, uh, well, we should probably continue with how you, um, how you decided to, to write in, in this universe since, um, you are John Ringo and you can, uh, write your own damn books. Uh, and you do. Well, the thing was, I was kind of stuck. Um, I'd done four books in the Black Tide Rising series, and I didn't. And I was just kind of, I was just kind of meh about other stuff. And I started thinking about MHI. The main books take place present day with a lot of present day technology. Um, and I started thinking about what would it be like in the 1980s, because Monster International, the company, was founded in 1895. So what was it like, and perhaps we should go back and discuss the MHI books a little bit, just for a moment. The basic concept of Monster International Universe is that there are monsters, there are things that go bump in the night. Um, they are covered up for reasons which is kind of gotten into in the main books, and I get into a little bit more in the spinoff. Um, and to take care of these monsters that go bump in the night, the government pays contractors to hunt them. Um, so they're monster hunters. And they get paid a fee for killing monsters. But it's all top secret. So they've got to keep it really on the down low. Um, and then in the second, the first book, 
that I wrote of the trilogy is set in the early 1980s in Seattle. And uh, it's, the main books are about fighting great big world-destroying stuff. In Grunge, I wanted to just take a look at what the life was like of a monster hunter on a day-to-day basis. And I created this character, Oliver Chad or Denny, call me Chad, um, who is, uh, boy, how do you explain Chad? Chad is very much a 1980s character. Um, Chad could have been a character in Chips. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, Chad is very much a 1980s guy. The Me Too movement, he just would not get it at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, he came from, uh, his background is interesting in that uh, he came from this really messed up family. Very, very messed up group of, uh, you know, his mom and dad are both academics. You know, it's a very, very messed up background. Um, he hates his mother viciously. He has zero respect for his dad because um, his dad is just a philandering jerk. Um, his mother is a is an anti-war activist, communist, and and to rebel, he joins the Marines. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, in the second book, which is called Sinners. He is transferred to New Orleans because he gets in, he gets in trouble for begging an elf chick. Um, and he gets transferred to New Orleans to get away from this elf clan that's really got it in for him in Seattle. Um, and when he gets to New Orleans, New Orleans is completely out of control in terms of monsters. And Larry had some issues with that, and I didn't get into it. It's Larry's universe. But... If it had turned out that monsters were overrunning New Orleans in the 1980s, everybody in the nation would have shrugged because New Orleans in the 1980s was such a freaking messed up place yeah. that if it turns out it was because of monsters, everybody just go, oh, well, that totally makes sense because <laughs> nothing else made sense about New Orleans in the 1980s. And I really yeah. tried to give that feel of just the insanity that was New Orleans in the 1980s. Um, And a lot of people who lived in New Orleans in the 1980s are like, dude, did you live here in the 1980s? I'm like, no, but I heard a lot about it. I did some research. And and it was was just nuts. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it really had a, I mean, it it had a, uh, I mean, you did the the research on Seattle. And, you know, I lived in Seattle for five years. You certainly caught that place. And, man, it felt like New Orleans, uh, that you caught in New Orleans as well. You mentioned early, uh, later in the book that uh, Chad, we don't get that book, but Chad uh, eventually works in Manhattan in, in New York um, and during the, the bad times there. And that's another place that one could imagine had an eruption of monsters <laughs> to cause all the, well, the, the pre-Giuliani uh, New York. Uh, New York in the 1970s, especially. I mean, that was when Billy Joel writes, uh, wrote uh, Miami 2017, wasn't it? Yeah, it's Miami 2017, where he's talking about, you know, I saw the lights go out in Broadway. Yeah. Um, and that was when they did Escape from New York, which was about, you know, at a certain point, you just put a wall around it and give up. Um, and it wasn't Escape from New York, it was Escape from Manhattan. Let's be precise, okay? Yeah. Well, it just got worse and worse until... Uh... <laughs> There was just no other alternative but to to have some law and order. But is, is that Kurt Russell re- re- escape from Manhattan? Escape from New York. Escape from New York. Um, well, you know Dinkins doesn't get the credit that he should for that because Dinkins actually was the one who uh, increased the NYPD and he was the one that started with broken window policing. Um, and I'm oh, not yeah. a big Democrat fan at all. But it was actually Dinkins who started that. I didn't realize that Dinkins put in the uh, the it wasn't it the police chief that wrote the broken that co-wrote the broken windows article with uh, James Q. Wilson, I think. Uh, that was uh, that was that was Dinkins that started that, and, huh. and Dinkins was really the one who came in and said we got to get the city under control, and you know that was a that was a black Democrat mayor. 
Um, yeah. And he was black, right? Yeah, he was black. Yeah. yeah. Yes, he was. And, uh, but, uh, you know, he was the one who started that. And Giuliani really, uh, it's not that Giuliani took all the credit for it. Giuliani did an awful lot of stuff, don't get me wrong. Um, but Giuliani really felt like he could do it better. Um, and, you know, New York has just changed amazingly. You know, one of the things we, we kind of touched on politics early on, and I don't want to touch on it a lot, is that, um, you know, a lot of people are freaking out about what's going on right now, and I'm freaking out a lot about what's going on right now. But truthfully, it's nothing compared to the 1970s. <laughs> it isn't. You know, the 1970s were the crazy years. Uh, are you saying that in regard to New York or the nation as a whole? The nation as a whole. Um, the 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 baby boomers who were the ones that created the the insanity of the 1970s um, because they were in their teens and 20s and and acting out the same way as millennials are right now. Um, they uh, they now are retiring and they've got money to pay for all of the millennials to act out their fantasies from when they were teenagers is basically what's going on. Um, and until they start dying off in droves, uh, it's not going to get any better. But once they start dying off in droves and they're, they're confined to nursing homes, it'll start to get better. <laughs> That's the bottom yeah. line. But well, it's... we had 1,300 bombings in the United States between 1968 and 1975. I mean, I was remembering this the other I don't want to get into a long discussion of the 70s, of course, but uh, I was remembering, you know, I was a kid uh, in 72, or I think it was when Wallace was, was making one of his runs and he got shot. And I was in Washington, D.C. then with my dad was uh, was at the was doing some work at the U.S. Geological Survey and we were up there staying and it was it was madness. I mean, I remember running through clouds of tear gas and uh human defecation everywhere and and we had to we we got evacuated from the washington monument because there was bomb scares and it was crazy craziness that year yeah well one of the things about these books is that the night you know the 1980s were after the 70s obviously but the 1980s was a time when even more so in, than in the 1970s in the 1980s it was like this there was this universal belief in what the, the technical term for it is millennialism, that the world was going to end at any moment. It was in the 1980s that you had War Day, you had Terminator, um, I'm trying to think of a couple of the other books that were all about the whole world, or the, you know, a couple other movies about, you know, the whole United States being wiped out by nuclear war. And that has been something you've had all the way back to Pat Frank's The Last Babylon. But in the 80s, it was just everywhere. Um, it was on television. It was in movies. And it was because the left was so terrified of Reagan starting a nuclear war. So you had this very, very uh, – you had a, a real thing about live fast, die young. Um, my kids were born in the 1990s. And I asked one of my daughters if, when she was growing up, she thought that there was no way she was going to live to 35. And she said, no, why? And I said, well, in the 1980s, I mean, I and all of my friends assumed we would not live past 35. It was just assumed that you were not going to make it. Um, or if you did, that you would, you know, it would be a fight for survival every single day. Um, and, you know, it, it's not just me. I mean, it was pretty much everybody that I hung out with felt the same way. No, sure. I remember it well. I mean, you, you, you had people, you know, being, because there was a, there was a nuclear threat that just isn't present today um, because Reagan won the Cold War. <laughs> that, uh, and they have no frigging clue what it was like back then and the the sort of atmosphere you you lived in and trying to explain it to them is, is useless you know kim jong un has a nuclear weapon oh my god he has missile he has a missile he could fire one at the west coast 
okay, I grew up with 1,500 of those fuckers pointed at us. Oh, shit, there I went and used the F word. Uh, That's okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And, you know, and I grew up in a town that has an army base in it. And so we knew we were targeted at <laughs> Fort McClellan. So yeah. anyway, place that there was no place that I lived that wasn't a target, except for the two years that I lived in Iran. You know, everywhere that I lived was a target. I lived in, I lived in Atlanta it was the third army headquarters. Yeah. Atlanta's going to get hit. I live not far from Dobbins air force base. Yeah. That's going to get hit. I lived in Orlando. Um, yeah, McCoy Air Force Base. That's going to get hit, you know. In uh, in uh, Alas Babylon, there's this, you know, description of Orlando basically being a whole bunch of craters, um, and you know, so that was very much a 1980s thing. It was a live fast, die young, because you're just not going to make it for very long. Have as much fun as you possibly can right now, um, or do whatever it is that you know, what works for you for right now. Um, and for Chad, it is killing monsters and and partying. Um, and and that's, that's, that's who he is. He just goes at life 100% all the time uh, because he knows that every moment could be his last. So it's, he's, he's this very kind of over-the-top character. You know, people say, you know, oh, all of your characters are super characters. And I'm like, my main characters are always super characters because if you're going to re- write the everyman, well, just go write Death of a Salesman over and over again. Okay? I get that. But when you're writing a, when you're writing an adventure tale, when you're writing something which is an archetypal romance, not a romance novel, but the archetype of romance, which is, yeah, sure. which is a hero- a, a, an heroic tale, your hero is by definition Abby Normal. So you have to have someone who may not appear abnormal on the surface, but ends up being an abnormal person. Uh, Mike O'Neill from the, from the, uh, uh, you know, him before battle, you were talking about the post link series. You know, this guy's just a web designer and he ends up being multiple congressional medals of honor. Um, uh, anyway, uh, and your guy in, uh, in the black tide rising series, uh, Steve Smith. Yeah, Steve Smith yeah. is a, a high school teacher. Um, you know, he's a high school history teacher. And, you know, his, his daughters are, you know, they're, they're normal kids on the surface. And then you put them into the right situation. You know, there are situations where certain people are going to excel where they don't excel in other situations. Yeah. Um, and Chad, Chad would not, Chad would have been, well, as it turns out, Chad would have been a great academic in almost any situation. But, you know, Chad would not have been um, essentially a superhero character had it not been for he was in that particular universe where he had that opportunity to be that guy. Um, it, anyway. Yeah. Um, well, another thing about Chad before we move on is that he – he uh, there are some other – there's other Ringo characters like this as well. I think he's a guy that has personal demons. Um, but in, in a lot of people, they are debilitating and off and the, they make them a little off putting as people, but that he's somebody that somehow managed to wrangle these to good use, um, found a way to overcome and, and sort of work and, and use them. Right. Yeah. That's, uh, uh, that's not, something that you find in all of my characters, but it's something you find in a lot of my characters because it's something that I find in a lot of military people and a lot of police officers. You know, yeah. People say, you know, uh, you know, look at these, these cops who are doing this horrible thing. And I look at it and I go, look at the 99.9% who have all those same demons, but don't let them out. Because, uh, you know, the nature of a sheepdog is to be a wolf first. And it's when you take that wolf and you, you put the chain on it yourself and say, okay, I am not going to be a wolf. I'm going to be a sheepdog. I don't know a single combat soldier who, isn't, who won't admit, at least on a personal level, you know, with somebody he trusts that, you know, yeah, he's basically a wolf, but he puts a, he puts a collar on himself and, and refuses to be the wolf. Um, and, 
And so that's something that you find very consistently. And it's something, it's a reason that my characters, uh, uh, my characters resonate with people who are like that. And because they can see themselves in that character. They can see that that character has, is, has issues, but, but, but uses those issues for good. Uh, the classic example of that is, uh, you called it the Kill Dark series, the Paladin of Shadows uh, that starts with Ghost. Um, Mike Harmon is just a seriously unpleasant human being in many, many ways. Uh, but then again, so was Alexander the Great. Um, you know, and, and Mike takes those demons and he channels them. You know, and one of the things that ticked me off about Star Wars is, you know, let the hate th- flow through you. You know what? Yeah, hate and anger can be great motivators. They can carry you forward when nothing else will. It's not love. It is not love that is going to carry you through battle. It's going to be hate and anger. Um, and that, you know, can you let that consume you? Absolutely. But one of the things about these books is showing people that have that hate and anger how to control it and how to only use it when you absolutely have to. Yeah. Um, and, and, and even for – it makes for a compelling reading and makes for a compelling real-life kind of character, although he does have that Doc Savage characteristic of being able to uh, – <laughs> he's always the smartest guy in the room. Um, and he likes to show it, too. He likes to rub it in some academics' faces, which is kind of fun. You know, Chad Chad is kind of a Doc Savage character. Um, but once again, it, you know, <laughs> if you're going to choose the main character for writing, ro- you know, archetypal romance, you don't want to choose somebody who doesn't have a Doc Savage at, uh, edge to him or her. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's, he's always complaining about, uh, having to read, um, ancient Tibetan though. (laughs) Well, Chad's gifts in terms of his intellectual gifts are fairly obvious given his familial background. What's really weird about Chad is his physical gifts, you know, that he has both the high physicality and the high intellect. Um, but I know character. I mean, I know people like that. I know people who, uh, you know, are close enough to chatty and tight that uh, that it's not that far outside of the realm of possibility for me. A lot of people look at these things and go, "Oh, that character's not, you know, that character's not realistic." Um, most people run into the same twenty-five people over and over and over again, but because of what I do, I run with a weirder crowd. And so I do run into people who are, you know, people who are off the charts. Um, you look at astronauts. Astronauts are off every freaking chart. Um, they're, they're off the chart intellectually. They're off the chart in terms of, of emotional stability. They're off the charts in terms of uh, physicality. Um, you know, there was a joke there for a while that the retirement position for Navy SEAL officers with astronauts because there's been, you know, if you're going to choose one group that supplies the most astronauts, it's not Air Force pilots, it's not Navy pilots, it's not Marine pilots, it's not Caltech or anything like that. The group that has the highest percentage of astronauts as a, you know, as a, as a major group is U.S. Navy SEALs. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, you know, I know a lot of people who are just, they're just extraordinary people. And I'm, I am very honored to know these people who are just extraordinary. Uh, but most people don't run into extraordinary people. You know, you just, yeah. and it, you know, you might pass one in the store and you don't know it. I end up having to, you know, I end up meeting them in terms of their extraordinary. Uh, you know, I met a former commander of Delta Force one time. He'd been a uh, he'd been a tunnel rat in Vietnam, enlisted, uh, had been recruited into the special forces, uh, went into he was one of the original four founders of Delta Force. Uh, he stayed in Delta Force, 
until he was a sergeant major. He'd been a sergeant major for long enough that they went, we're just going to make you a first lieutenant. Uh, when I met him was in 2005, 2006, and he was a full colonel in the Army. Um, and this guy spoke. He had four silver stars, two distinguished service cross, one still under consideration for upgrade to the Medal of Honor when the operation was declassified. And he spoke 27 languages. 27? 27. He's not the only person I know who speaks, who spoke in excess 20, in excess 20 languages. Uh, Dr. Rizwana Shelley, who's mentioned is, is in, who is a character in the Black Tide universe, uh, Pakistani British lady that I knew when I was a kid and still have kept in, in touch with over the years. She has six PhDs and speaks in the same, same range between 20 and 30 languages. Um, and, uh, and her PhDs aren't like, you know, gender studies. They're uh, chemistry, biology, physics, uh, nuclear physics, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, well, there's, uh, so, there's clearly extraordinary people in the world. And um, I suspect uh, a lot of them like reading your books. Well, the, that former commander of Delta Force, first time I met him, he walked up to me and he very, very quietly shook my hand and he said, Mr. Ringo, you have a fine hand for writing The Warrior. And that was a really nice compliment. It was very well phrased. A lot of people say, oh, I'm your biggest fan. Oh, I love your books. But you have a fine hand for writing The Warrior. Is a, it, was a, yeah. it was very, very eloquently phrased. I didn't find out that he was former commander of Delta Force until later. <laughs> <laughs> he, was the command, he was the commander of the rescue mission in Mogadishu. Well, that's, that's very cool. Yeah. Um, well, uh, back to back to science a little bit. Um, so the book if we were we're going to talk about the locales. Um, we mentioned them. Uh, it takes place in several places, including Oxford, England, which is a really cool se segment or two there. Uh, but it's it's a at heart a New Orleans book, and you really evoke the locale. Kind of took what we think we know about New Orleans and and push it over the top and add magic, New Orleans, I mean, uh, add magic and monsters. Um, how'd you about, how'd you go about this? Did you research New Orleans? Do you, uh, you have a special feel for New Orleans personally? Google Street View is your friend. <laughs> That's the answer. Um, yeah. it really, really is. Google Street View is your friend. Uh, I, uh, I knew that I wanted to set it in New Orleans, and I had the choice of going to New Orleans and researching it. New Orleans is really hot, and I didn't want to do that. Um, yeah, you famously don't like heat, right? No, I don't like heat. Um, and uh, Or I could use Google Street View. So I used Google Street View. Um, <laughs> now, it was post-Katrina in New Orleans, uh, so there were certain things that weren't, actually the case in the 1980s, but I checked to make sure that all of the locations that I used had existed in the 1980s. It, there were locations that I didn't use because they don't exist post-Katrina, but they did in the 1980s. You know, that was... Um, but yeah, in Saints, uh, I do go out of New Orleans because Chad is... Chad gets in trouble with the powers that be and can't do his job. So he decides to get his PhD um, in <laughs> in Yeti ethnology. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. <well. laughs> Another identity group we're going to have to deal with soon, John. The, the genesis of these books was I got really jazzed about it. I didn't have any other ideas at the time, and I got and I just got got so jazzed about it that I just started writing. And I'm writing these books and I'm posting snippets online of, you know, I'm doing fan fiction is what I'm doing. And somebody says, hey, John, have you told Larry? And I'm like, ooh, hang on a second. So by then I had more of a relationship with Larry. But anyway, I contacted Larry. I said, hey, Larry, I want to do, I want to do some books in your universe. Do you mind? And he's like, oh, wow, let me see. No, I don't mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> we had some creative differences afterwards, but we got them worked out. Um, yeah. But anyway, so I wrote these three books real quick, 
and uh, and real quick, like in a month and a half, I wrote all three of them. Um, and I sent them to Larry, and I'm like, here you go, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, in that book, he he's gotten in trouble, so he's oh, but after I had written the book, I got the RPG for the Monster Hunter International Universe. So, by the way, for those of you who are listening who don't know, there's a role-playing game for the MHI universe that you can get from Larry. Um, and in the RPG, it's got all this stuff about different monsters, obviously. And so I went to check on Sasquatch because he had mentioned that Sasquatch existed. And in the book, in the actual – actually, I might have got the RPG while I was writing them. But in the actual book, it said that the first that, – that Sasquatch had been in, uh, suspected for a long time, and they were sort of known to be around, but the first definitive work on them was done in the 1980s. So I went, well, let's have Chad be the guy who did the definitive work. <laughs> so, and that, that's a really cool section of the book. Um, can you talk a little bit about that library you created at Oxford and, and the whole British monster? Well, that was that the the unseen library was a was a bow to Terry Pratchett. Um, my my comfort books, my what am I going to read when I I don't feel like reading my own stuff or other science fiction or stuff that I have to read. My comfort books for a long time were Terry Pratchett, um, and I still go back to certain Pratchett books over and over again. Uh, he's somebody that I, I frequently reread. And, of course, he passed away while I was writing the book. Um, so when Chad was going to Oxford and he was dealing with uh, the, the top secret library for all the, the, the real mystical stuff um, at Oxford, I, of course, had to make it the Unseen University because the university in Terry Pratchett's St. Mortport is based on Oxford. Um, so... It, it was a it was a bow to the, the late great Sir Terry Pratchett, um, but uh, uh, the Van Helsing Institute had been mentioned in the main books, and so uh, Chad actually gets along better with Van Helsing than he does with his own company, uh, because Van Helsing is a little bit more academically oriented than MHI, and Chad, despite the fact that he hates academia and he he hates his parents who are academics eventually ends up in academia um, and kind of hates himself for it, but he's just too curious a person not to, basically. Um, but after his experiences with the Sasquatch, he, uh, uh, with the Sasquatch in, in Washington State, he takes them on as a project in terms of learning about them and learning about their different branches. Uh, so he studies the skunk apes and you know, – South Florida, and he studies the uh, God. I can't remember the name of them. In the the, Lor- the Laurentian Yetis, uh, there's a there's a term for them up there, um, and and develops all of their languages, learns all their languages, and and writes the definitive dictionary for all of them, uh, so that you know people can communicate with them. Um, my favorite moment in all of that is when he was. He figured out the etymology of the Laurentian Yeti, and certain words were loan words from uh, from Native American, uh, and certain words were were obviously Yeti derivatives. But there were some words that he hadn't quite figured out until he until one of the uh, Quebecois porters dropped a Duluth pack on his foot and let out the string of curses, and he went, Ah, okay, now I understand where those words come. from. Anyway, <laughs> well, there's I mean, there's uh, several uh, sections of scholarly detective work in the book that are kind of fascinating to follow um, that that Chad goes off on. Uh, that must have been. I don't know what your maybe Pratchett was an influence, but they're 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 fun and cool in themselves as little vignettes. Well, I certainly hope that people think so. Um, the previous two books have been pretty heavily action-oriented. There had been some stuff about Chad's uh, interest in linguistics, for example. Um, In the first book, he figures out how to communicate with Knowles and Seattle so that he can uh, 
uh, he can get information from them. Um, and he learns certain other languages because he has to. Uh, but, you know, in, in Saints, I really get into that very heavily. But all of that builds, you know, all, it's all a plot point, if you will. Not so much the stuff about the Yetis, but the stuff about his linguistics, his, his academic background and everything else eventually lead to the climax. Yeah. Well, it's all about, I mean, it, he kills monsters with this knowledge. <laughs> it's... Yes, that's exactly it. Yeah, his, his whole thing is about, you know, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a T-shirt, um, knowledge is power, power corrupts, study hard, be evil. Um, you know, Chad's whole thing is, you know, study this whole field so that you can get better at understanding what's going on so that you can do the job better. Well, one of the things he finds is um, the origins of this thing called a Mava Panava, um, which is what is going on in New Orleans, the, the phenomenon that's the, the big one that he has, to, he has to deal with in the book. Um, what is, other than the fact that worms are just creepy and nasty as hell, um, what is so shudder-inducing and compelling about this sort of Lovecraftian uh, vein of monster that, um, that you wanted to use it? Um, most people don't like tentacles. Uh, there are certain <laughs> there are certain very common fears. Uh, snakes. Um, one of the ones uh, that causes arachnophobia is actually a fear of small circles closely placed together in a pattern. And it's one of those fears that nobody can quite understand. But if you have arachnophobia and you look at certain photos that have certain that have small circles put together in a certain pattern, it causes an instant fear reaction. Uh, it's, it's very, very primal. It's, it's, you know, everybody says it's the greatest fear of public speaking, but something like 75% of people that look at certain photographs um, have have an instinctive primal fear reaction to it. Uh, it's one of the weirdest phobias out there. Um, and certain types of fungi form in that way, and so there are a lot of people who have a who have a revulsion to certain fungi because they've seen that and it's caused that fear reaction, and they don't even realize what's going on. Um, so that was sort of my approach, and unfortunately, I couldn't do the the eyes thing very well. Um, but uh, uh, you know, people don't like tentacles. Uh, that's another thing. That that has to do with snake fear. It has it's very close to fear of uh, of arthropods and arachnids, and and so that Lovecraftian tentacled monster sort of thing is uh, is something that triggers a fear reaction fairly automatically. It's cheating, basically. <laughs> And so the um, so Chad's having to face this thing. It's got like what pseudo pseudo branches. It's kind of like a mycelium of a mushroom that's that's popping up around New Orleans. I think something. Uh, there is actually a specific species of clam. Um, sorry, I am looking it up online. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to find the name of it. Uh, I'm trying to see the... Uh, I used to know what the name of the species was. File shell is what you can usually find it on. But if you just... Uh, if you just uh, do a search online for clam with tentacles and look at it. That's what it actually looks like. Uh, it, it is, it's a file shell is what it's called. And it, it is a clam with tentacles. Um, and it's really creepy looking. Um, <laughs> so, uh, a lot of the stuff in, in my books, uh, I went, I did not complete my degree in marine biology, but I was working on a degree in marine biology um, and got within like 
a semester of it. Um, and won't won't say why I didn't finish. It's stupid. But uh, I got within like a semester of it. And so I'm very fascinated by biology. So biology has informed a lot of my science fiction. Um, I'm, I'm much more of a biology guy than I am a space guy. When I've got to do pure space stuff like the Troy series, it's every single time I've got to go back and relearn college physics. And it kind of drives me nuts. But uh, the uh, but biology informs a lot of my science fiction. Uh, so I've got, you know, I get into the biology of alien species. And so when I'm looking for something weird, I usually go into biology because you can find it. <laughs> it's everywhere, man. Yeah. And this one also uh, in the book comes from a horrible, twisted other dimension. Uh, it's 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 basically like a larval old one, right? Something like that. It is. That's that's exactly what it is. The larval old one. I wasn't going to get into it. Freaking hard to kill. But okay, we'll get into the end of the book. It's the larval old one. <laughs> well, I mean, they they they, they say as much. Uh, Toward the, at, near the beginning, that you know, this is a suspicion. Um, is at, what are some of the weapons that work against this? Let's. We should probably talk about weapons anyway, because there's a it lot of them. Hunter. There's a lot of them in here. Um, in addition to uh, half-inch shells, uh, the fifty caliber, which is basically what you need to even dent a uh, oh that Sobek thing. Um, there's a lot of uh, placed explosives in this book as well, right? You Well, in this series, one of the things that I liked about MHI was that uh, Larry is a big gun and explosions guy. Um, he's a big gun guy uh, and, and worked for an evil defense manufacturer at one point. He was their accountant. Um, and... I think it was a partner in the firm. But uh, one of the things I liked about the universe was that when it came time to pull out the firepower, they did not stint. Uh, you know, if it took a rocket launcher, they used a freaking rocket launcher. Um, so in these books, Chad is a firm believer in not stinting, and he drives around in this increasingly battered. He he bought a 1976 Cutlass when he was in high school, uh, uh uh, yeah, 76 Cutlass Delta Supreme and rebuilt it, and refurbished it and everything. And then, and he's, he's always really careful about it until he gets to New Orleans. And then it just becomes increasingly battered by New Orleans. Um, but in the trunk, which is a very capacious trunk, uh, it's not like the movie or you know, the TV show Supernatural. It's not, you know, a couple of guns and, you know, some, some other stuff. No, it's packed. His trunk is like when he stops at a place, he's got to get stuff out. It's just okay. Hang on a second. I got to get out some claymores. They're down the bottom. I mean, it's claymores. It's C4. It's light. You know, it's light any tank weapons. It's a Barrett sniper rifle. It's, you know, he's got it all in his trunk, <laughs> along with a lot of ammo. Um, you know, yeah. you rear end this guy, and it's the end of your life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it would be what is he calls that car honey honeydew or something like that uh honey bear honey bear yeah honey bear yeah That was part one of a two-part interview with John Ringo discussing Monster Hunter Memoirs Saints. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. This is another entry in Alliance of Equals, a Leaden Universe novel by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Beset by the angry remnants of the Department of the Interior and challenged at every turn by opportunist on their new homeworld of Sherbleek, and low on funds, 
Clan Corval desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, master trader Sean Yosgalen and Corval's premier trade ship, Dutiful Passage, is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with existing loops and secondary routes. But re-establishing trade and preserving the lives of the few remaining members of the clan aren't all of Corval's problem. Matters come to a head as Dutiful Passage, accustomed to being welcomed and feeded at those ports on its call list, finds itself denied docking and blacklisting while agents of the DOI mount an armed attacks on others of Corval's traders under the very eyes of port security systems. Traveling with dutiful trader on this unsettling journey is Patty Yoskalen, the master trader's heir and his apprentice. Patty is eager to make up for time lost due to Corval's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior, but she is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age, and perhaps her very life, is threatened by it. And here is the latest entry in Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals. Chapter 35 Admiral Bunter Tolly sat down in his own chair and keyed into the console. Key codes gleamed on his screen, but he didn't access them. Rather, he checked the interface, looking for traps or falls. Then he scanned the logs, including ongoing system stats, changes, and updates. He didn't find anything curious or even interesting. Which didn't surprise him, exactly. Inky could wipe a log with the best of them, not to mention that she knew when and how to turn logging off. He half thought that she might have left a message for him, or some kind of clue in logging. Given the number of times in this operation that she'd dutifully fulfilled the Institute's mandates while also creating conditions that would somewhat mitigate the effect of dutiful obedience, it wasn't completely out of the question. And Truth said that was an intriguing ability and he almost hoped he caught up with her again so he could ask her how she managed it. This time, though, he was disappointed. Inky had left no log records, nor a personal note for him detailing the locations of the traps and the kills. Fair enough, he thought, leaning back in his chair and smiling slightly. He'd just have to find them on his own. Tolly, Admiral Bunter, spoke from behind and above him. Is there something wrong? No more than there was five minutes ago, he said. Just savoring the moment is all. He looked over his shoulder and upward. You sure you want to go through with this, he asked. We discussed the pros and cons, the Admiral said. I understand that it is possible that this action will cause me to cease to exist. I accept this. I would rather cease to exist than live in a state of uncertainty and enslavement. Just making sure. He looked back to the screen, closed his eyes, and focused himself with a quick mental exercise, opened his eyes, and tapped up the main screen. The keys glowed there, tempting and powerful. The keys to heaven, one of his teachers used to call them. All right, then, he murmured to himself rather than to the admiral. Let's see what grand adventure lies before us. He extended his hand to the screen and accepted the keys. He was blind. No. Sean corrected himself, around the taste of loss, of course he was not blind. Could he not perfectly well see the street, glossy with recent rain? Or that group of people just there, chatting among themselves? And did he not note the woman who went hurrying past them, all but running on the rain-slick street? Of course he wasn't blind. His eyes were doing precisely what they ought. However, there was a strange flatness to the group of friends, 
the hurrying woman, his escort with her arm through his, and bearing more of his weight than he wished to acknowledge. You used too much of yourself, and your talent has gone dry, Tarona Rusk said. Never fear, it will return in time. How much time? You have a gift for questions, little healer. Have you a gift for answers? I am no match for you, she sighed. Soon or late, dependent upon such things as may be measured, but which are not precise. I will tell you, the machine's kiss is dire. It alone would have left you diminished for some while. The kiss and such reckless spending as you have done? He felt her shrug. Consult a healer is my advice. Thank you. Perhaps I shall. She laughed softly. Do not blame me. I had backed a different outcome. So you had. They crossed under the hotel's portico, walking slowly to spare his strength. She slowed suddenly, her grip on his arm tightening. Hold, she murmured in his ear. I know these. Sean straightened and heard her chuckle. No, do not gird yourself for war. It would appear that a pair of my colleagues have come under the attention of port security. We will pass them by, and I will see you into the hotel, as I promised, before we part. Stay, he said to her. Corval will protect you. Ah, now there's an honorable offer, but one I must refuse. I have no need of, nor use, for Corval's protections. I have keys and codes and knowledge, and I mean to use them well. We will walk on, no one will mind us. And when we achieve the lobby, you will call upon the desk to assist you, and I will go my way. They walked, as she said and no one stopped them or even seemed very much interested in them, past the two men speaking earnestly with the security team and the guard upon the door until they entered the lobby, and Tarona Rusk let him go. Farewell, Sean Yosgalen, she said, and bowed as one acknowledging a debt which can never be repaid. I thank you for the gift of my life and the opportunity to achieve balance within it. It was on the tip of his tongue to urge her again to shelter under the dragon's wing, but a hand fell on his shoulder and he unsteadily turned to face a long-jawed man in an orange security vest. Master Trader Yosgalen? Yes, Come with me, please, sir. I'm afraid there's been some unpleasantness. Unpleasantness? Fear stabbed him. Had loot kept his word? My daughter, he said. Just this way, the guard said soothingly, moving his hand toward the bank of elevators. Sean took a step and stopped, looking over his shoulder to say a proper farewell to Tarona Rusk but she was gone. Four men dead, they said, and extensive damage to the property. Glass dust glittered on every surface, on every body. Paddy shone like an ice maiden, her eyes closed, her face expressionless, her breathing as slow as if she were in trance. He touched her hair. He called her name, softly. There was no response. The doctor says shock, said the head of the investigation crew. Kaorly Bryce was her name, Sean recalled. She's the only survivor. Bruising on her shoulder consistent with being struck with a heavy object, no other trauma. The others, she sighed. Two dead by hand, broken necks. The other two speared back to front with glass shards as wide as your hand. I'll tell you what, Master Trader Yosgalen, I'd give a lot to find where all this glass came from. Sean shook his head wearily. He had answered questions. 
He had directed port security to the Garden of Gems and to poor Vanner's body. He had told them everything that had happened, to the limit that they would understand, which gave them an ambitious criminal who sought to hold a master trader for ransom from his ship. He had no names for the other dead. Paddy's dead, as he thought of them. Eventually, the team leader went away, and shortly after, a medic lifted Paddy onto a stretcher while others readied the dead for transport. You're her parent? the medic asked him. I am, yes. The doctor gave her a field exam, said she's in no danger. There's an ambulance on the way to take her to the hospital so she can be checked out thorough. That's the best course, sir. But as her parent, you need to agree. I agree, he said, and the medic nodded. We'll just take her down now to the holding room off the lobby, he said. Whisk her right out when the car pulls in. He looked down at Sean's mangled and bloody sleeve and looked up again. You're all right yourself, sir. I'm tired, he said truthfully, and worried about my daughter. Sure you are. You come on along with us now. You can rest a bit in the holding room. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, and that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to Bain intern Jonathan Graubert for editing help, and the podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And an utterly still writing room held at 39.9 degrees Fahrenheit and filled with perfect autumn light and a couple of cases of smokes and a Barrett machine gun for letting off a little steam during breaks, plus all the thanks and praise for John Ringo, co-author with Larry Correa of Monster Hunter Memoirs, Saints. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. Please.